Here is a basic diagram of the experimental setup we came up with last time. Now, do you see how the transmission line is open on the sides and at the ends? We have approximately a plane wave condition in the middle of the transmission line, but we also have fields that will be spraying away from the edges of the transmission line and on the sides. And then on the ends, of course, then we have issues of it um, being open on the ends. We saw the fields, uh, fringing fields, uh, on the edges of the transmission line earlier when we looked at the microstrip transmission line shown here. The electric field sprays outwards along the edges of the transmission line. This generally may not be a problem, uh, but for the amplitude of the electric fields that we're considering, corresponding to a nuclear explosion EMP, we need to consider how important it is to protect other people who may be running the experiment or even the experimental equipment. Is it safe to be near the edges of the transmission line? Or is it better to have people at the end of the transmission line, uh, maybe behind the source? Of course, then we can also consider how we might terminate the transmission line so we don't get reflections from the ends that will then contaminate our result, or perhaps, or create hazards beyond the transmission line. At any rate, let's uh, for now consider what impact an EMP might have on a human body standing nearby. And see how important it is, when you, it is to protect the people nearby. Since we use Maxwell's equations to solve for electromagnetic wave propagation, Let's examine Maxwell's equations to see what we can learn about how electric and magnetic fields would interact with different materials. Remember there are several different ways of writing Maxwell's equations. Here I'm showing the version of Maxwell's equations that solves for the electric and magnetic fields over time and at a single position in space. It's the pointwise form. Now if I were to describe these two equations in words, I would say for Ampere's law, if you have an electric current density, or if you have a time-changing electric flux density D at a position in space, you'll get H fields circulating around that position. And for Faraday's law, if we have a time-changing B field at a position in space, we'll get electric fields circulating around that point in space. Well, so far these two equations don't really seem to give us much information about any effects different materials would have. But we also introduced two other equations, the constitutive relations, which we use to reduce our four unknowns down to two unknowns. Looking at the constitutive relations, we see a perme permeability term and a permittivity term. Aha! This is where we can start to see the effects of materials on the electromagnetic waves. Don't worry, we'll be talking, we'll be talking more about uh, these equations. But for now, using the constitutive equations, we could write Ampere's and Faraday's laws as follows. So for D, I could put in epsilon E, and for B, I could put in mu H. Now, the permeability is interesting when we have ma materials that are magnetic, but the human body isn't particularly magnetic. So for the moment, let's focus on the permittivity term. To understand how the permittivity of a material influences electromagnetic wave propagation, we need to consider how electric charges react to electric fields. Experiments have indicated that uh, the um, that there's a, the inverse square central forces exist. And here's an example. We are very familiar with gravity, so let's remind ourselves of gravitational forces. These follow an inverse square law which we'll also see in a moment for, um, with electric charges. According to Newton's law of gravitation, what's written here, the force between two masses, m1 and m2, is inversely proportional to the square of how far apart they are, the distance r between them. So in, uh, in this equation, m1 is the mass of object 1, m2 is the mass of object sorry, m1 is the mass of object 1, m2 is the mass of object 2, 
r is the distance between the two objects and r hat is the unit vector oriented from one mass to the other gives a direction and g is a gravitational constant the inverse square law can be described in words as like this a force field extends outward from mass one in all directions equally as this force field gets farther and farther away from mass one the force field spreads out over an area that is bigger and bigger it's spreading out over the surface area of a sphere extending outward from this mass and the radius of that sphere is getting bigger and bigger and bigger now since the surface area of a sphere the equation is 4 pi r squared the strength of the force field reduces as 1 over r that's where we get the r squared on the bottom so I guess I could put a capital R there that's the inverse square law now switching over to electromagnetic fields measurements also have indicated that charges exert forces on each other via an inverse square law using the gravitational inverse square law as an example spend a minute writing out what you think Coulomb's law would be for the separation of charge as shown here we have charge Q and Q prime and they're separated by some distance R 